Good morning, everybody. This is Caleb with Stain and Seal Experts. You're watching the Stain and Seal Show. A little late this morning. Had some technical difficulties with the computer here. I'm a stain guy trying to do uh, computers, so apologize about that. And um, just wanted to say good morning to everybody. Had a big week. And um, if you're watching the show for the first time, if you don't mind, please uh, say hello where you're from and who you are. If you're on Facebook, make sure you say uh, say what your name is so we know who you are because Facebook does have privacy settings where we can't see who you are uh, when you make a comment. So wanted to take a quick moment to shout out to some of our partners, um, some of our sponsors, people that we are sponsoring, actually, not, not our sponsors, but people we're sponsoring. We're sponsoring the Fence Industry Podcast over at Dan Wheeler. So if uh, we believe in what Dan's doing in the fence industry and uh, putting out a lot of great information. So check out the Fence Industry Podcast. Joe Everest channel, the fence expert. He does a ton of, uh, he does a ton of content about staining and sealing. So, um, definitely we love to support that channel. And then also my fence life. This is Dan Blanc, uh, fence King and, uh, Cannon Johnson over at Jackson fence in Tennessee. So, um, those are two good guys putting out a lot of information. If you use job Nimbus or thinking about using job Nimbus, they just did an episode all about that subject, which job Nimbus is actually what we use. So, I enjoyed watching that episode. But good morning. Weather yesterday was not great. And I'm looking out the window. It's a good day to stain today if it's dry, but it doesn't look like it's going to stay dry for long. So how was your week in the stain in business? Did you guys get anything done this uh, this week? Did you, um, what happened? I'm looking here at work orders on my desk. Looks like we didn't do a whole lot because of the weather. So lots of cleaning jobs, just a few staining jobs. So anyways, Failure. I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about failure and, um, you know, failure is good. A lot of people fail all the time. I do. I make lots of failures, but I noticed something this last week that, um, cause I had a big failure and I noticed something that I thought was strange. I've never, I never really remember feeling this before. So I got an opportunity to, um, to go to Colorado and climb a 14,000 foot mountain. Never done that before. So, I thought it would be a great idea to go. All I had to do was get there. So I got there and it was really tough to get out there. I went to Telluride, Colorado. There is no, no direct anything to Telluride. You got to fly here, fly there, and then drive a couple hours. Beautiful drive. Lots of stain going on. Everything in Colorado is stained rust red. Everything. One color. Um, so anyways, but we get to this, um, I get to this place. And uh, the first day we go, we do call, it's called uh, the Iron Path Via Ferrata. And it's, um, it's about 10,500 feet up in the air. And basically, you're walking across um, a, a, a rock ledge that's this wide. It's as wide as your foot. And in a lot of places, there's, there's only just a little, there's just a little nub there, maybe, maybe an inch or two inches wide that you can just purchase your foot on. So anyways, um, pretty crazy there, made all the way across that and, um, you know, 600 feet fall everywhere you went, went all the way across, finished it, uh, it was about three or four hours. That was great. So the next day, um, we're going to climb El Diente, which means the tooth, I guess that's Spanish and it's a 14,000 footer and it's, it's about a 12 mile trip to get, to get there and back. And, uh, so 2.30, I get up in the morning and get out to the truck, meet everybody. We ride out to this place, and by 4 o'clock, we have begun our ascent up this mountain. It's, it's dark. We're in the wilderness. have no clue where I'm at. Can't see anything. We're wearing headlamps, and we're rolling through this. Um, we're rolling through here. And just to paint a better picture, I'm gonna, I want to share a couple of photos with you guys and show you. Um, but this this place, the Milky Way, when you're at 10,000 feet at, at my house, I'm about 800 feet elevation. The Milky Way looks like it's about four inches wide at 10,000 feet. It looks like it's about four miles wide. The Milky Way gets a lot wider when you get up higher. So that was pretty. Um, that was interesting. I was surprised. And uh, so. Let's see here. So we're moving through the woods and 
we're going up and we're going down and we're going up and we're going down, putting miles on. Uh, we take a couple of quick stops, get a drink of water and keep moving. And we're wearing packs. They're pretty heavy. And, uh, and then we get into the to gravel, like, like slate gravel. And um, I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. But we're getting into to slate gravel, which is really loose. And, um, man, it's tough. It was tough on my knees and things like that. And uh, it kept going, no problem. And um, got your pictures loaded up here. Should have done this earlier, but I didn't think about it. So, so we're walking through the gravel, and it's it's not like anything I've ever seen before. And um, so we keep moving, but I'm I'm getting to the next level, and we're going into rocks. And there's these big, huge rocks. The rocks are like uh, basically half cinder blocks, and we're walking through these, and. Um, and these things are all wild. They're all moving. Um, they are, they are definitely not stable. And so, going through that is tough. And so here's our here's here's at night. Here's what we see um, after we've just before we get into the rocks. I'll upload this overlay so you guys can see it. So this is kind of the view. This is this is person in front of me with uh, this is the person in front of me with their headlamp. And this is sun. So this is probably around 536 in the morning because we're we're pretty close. This mountain on the right here is a, is a smaller one. The one in the back that looks smaller, that one's far off. That's actually the 14,000 foot. Or this one over here is pretty close. But anyways, headlamps. We're moving through. And um, once, like I said, once we get to the rocks, things things are different. Now I'm going to show you the rocks because this is a video and um, I'll just do a quick screen share and show you what that looks like. So if hopefully you guys can hear this, um, but the rocks, this was the first level of rocks. So these were the little small rocks and um, these were just slippery. These were just slippery. So here we go on this. Let's get that overlay off. Here we go. And this is straight up, straight up the mountain here. So there we go. Got a long way to go. And you can't breathe up there. It's not like uh, it's not like at home. There's no air. So I'm pointing to the top there. So, anyways, we keep moving. We get all the way uh, into the big rocks, which I'm not going to show you because it doesn't really matter. But um, next, like I said, the big rocks, and then we get into really big boulders, and we're having to climb across boulders, and we're and we're going and going and going, and um, we get all the way to twelve thousand seven hundred feet. We're we're hurt, and um, but and and you know the whole way I thought I was the whole way going up there, I thought that little voice in my head that said "quit, you can't do it" would be there, but he never stood up surprisingly. Uh, which I thought was a really good win, but um, voice didn't show up. So get to 12,700 feet and I'm looking up ahead of me and there's a guy up ahead of me and he's looking like this. He's looking at the sky and then at the back of the line, there's a guy and he says, hey, Willie, who's up at the top. He looks at him and he goes like this. He makes the he makes the hand motion like like. Um, you know, hand back and forth under his neck, like, hey, we got to, we got to cut this thing off. And um, I thought, what does that mean? We got, we had to, we had to call it off because of weather, basically. So we got, we got to 12,700 feet, got 10 miles um, and had to call it off because of weather. And, um, and I just wanted to go because I was 1,300 feet from the top. I was one hour from the top. I put all that time in to be one hour from the top. And I was so surprised at how disappointed um, and upset I was to get that far and uh, and stop. And so I think the lesson I learned was you have to, the, the, the last 1,300 feet of that trip was probably going to be tough, but it wasn't going to be the hardest part uh, of the trip. So, the, so I think the lesson that I learned there, the thing that I, I learned to reflect on was sometimes in life we go so far 
uh, you go through all the hard stuff. And then the whole way back was so hard. Um, you know, it was just coming down the hills, always worse than going up and, uh, the knees, the ankles were sore and all of that, all of that felt to me like it was for nothing. So I took all the emphasis off the 90%, getting 90% of my goal completed, but because I didn't finish it, it was like, I didn't do anything. I didn't give myself any credit. So sometimes in life and in business, you set a big goal, you miss it. I usually miss the goal every year in business, you know, because I always set really big goals, always fall short and uh, getting better at that. But when you set these big goals, um, whether you hit them or not, but specifically if you do miss those goals, don't forget about all the hard work, all the effort and all the little wins you had along the way uh, to get to where you couldn't go any further. And then the thing about it is um, because you can come back and you can do it again. I can go back and climb that mountain again. The weather will be better. And um, that's just the way it is. So anybody who anybody who does anything and uh, they just fall a little bit short of their goal and then they just feel like a total miserable failure. Take a look at what you did to get there and then ask yourself. The whole the whole way was that easy or was it hard? You did hard stuff. So anyways, pat you off on the back because sometimes um, you don't have to get to the top. You know, you don't always have to get to the top. But there was a story once about a man who climbed Mount Everest way, way, way a long time ago. Um, like in the 20s, maybe 1925 or something. I can't remember when it was. But he was uh, he was an explorer, climbed Mount Everest. He failed it multiple times. And on his third or fourth attempt, um, he was he come back down and he was in like a press briefing. And there were lots of camera, you know, newspaper people at that time. And uh, one of the men in the back raised his hand up and he said, um, he said, how does it feel to 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 be a, such a failure to not be able to uh, climb Mount Everest? And I think no one had climbed it at that time. And he said. He, he just looked up kind of in the air like he was talking to the mountain and he said, he said, Mount Everest, you have stopped growing, but I have not. And then later he did climb Mount Everest. So that's the way it goes. But let's say good morning. We got a Facebook user here. Looks like Mr. Stan Frank is there. Um, you guys know him up in Wisconsin or Wisconsin, staining uh, lots of cabins, uh, log homes, things like that. One of the best in business. We got somebody that says, good morning, boss. Don't know who you are, but good morning. If you if you want to say hello, uh, include your name if you're on Facebook. And uh, we got Building Wash NC. That's actually a pretty good name. We wash buildings. Um, good morning to you. Recommendation on a pressure washer. All my fences are one to two year old cedar just for light cleaning. Hey, just a little three and a half or four gallon a minute machine on wheels at 3,500 or 4,000 PSI is probably a great place to start. Roger Bettencourt, good morning. I'll try to get you out of here in time to go see Joe. And um, somebody on Facebook says they sold two staining jobs since TCAM. So we did a TCAM training event a couple weeks ago. Glad to hear it. Um, hope you hope you get your stain over there at TCAM. They got a lot of stain in stock. Uh, that would be that would be great. Somebody here says we could all move to Colorado and make a living staining. There's wood everywhere. You are right about that. There is there is wood everywhere in Colorado. It's a beautiful place and it's dry. The, the restoration work would just be unbelievable there. It's so dry and drier climates. Wood just seems to come so clean with, with almost zero pressure. Fuzz is a lot less um, for whatever reason in super dry climates. You can apply restoration chemicals on wood and it just it's a lot harder to fuzz the wood out there than it is um, where the rest of us live. Good morning from Kasura Distributors. Good morning. Um, if you need stain in the Northeast, contact Kasura Distributors. If you don't mind, guys, drop a link uh, to where people can find you because they they've got a ton of stain in stock and they cover the entire Northeast region of the United States. We got Wally from uh, from Ottawa, Canada here. He's in the fence industry and uh, good morning. What do you offer in dip tanks? Uh, Wally, we can show you how to build one. Um, at this point, with steel prices and labor shortages in the steel industry, uh, we're just not making dip tanks, but we can certainly show you how to make one and get you started there. 
Good morning, Bam. Michael Taylor. Bam Bam is in the house. It is his birthday yesterday. So if everybody on here watching would please give uh please give uh please give him a, a happy birthday. Jake Bell says, Did you see any snakes? No, didn't see any snakes. I saw a lot of deer, saw a lot of marmots, saw foxes, coyotes, um, and a lot of small mammals that I don't know what they were. I've never seen them before. Lots of vegetation I've never seen. Um, I'm going to kill this fly if he keeps buzzing me, though. Let's see. Roger Bettencourt says, no time constraints. Joe's doing live on Friday for the next few weeks. Hopefully that goes well for him because they're a distributor. So anyways, but what is, so good morning, everybody. Glad you joined. I want to talk this morning. Obviously, we want to take some questions, but I really want to talk this morning about um, what's going on in, uh, what's going on. I'm going to show you here. Uh, myself and Bam when we were at the TCAM event. And I just want, I want to play this video. I want to show it to you guys because I do think it is, I do think that it is um, helpful. And, um, but also uh, I wanted to elaborate on it a little more. So here we go. If, if you guys are ready, we'll just jump right into it. Um, so here we are. Hopefully, I'm going to bounce back and forth real quick and make sure you guys can see that. Okay, looks like you can. So, if you can't hear it, throw up the throw up the alarm alarm bells. But uh, let's go with it. There we go. So we're in the at the TCAM event. We have hijacked Joe's channel, and we're going to talk about a couple of uh, a, a couple of um, five mistakes we see most common in wood restoration. So a lot of you guys know this, but some of you don't. So hopefully this is. This is helpful. We're going to play it and stop it and play it and stop it between each one of these segments. This is just a five minute video. So uh, this should get us started well on our way to talking about mistakes in wood restoration. Make sure the volume's up nice and loud and go. Hey, this is Caleb. Caleb. This is Bam. Bam. We, we probably wondering where Joe, Joe is. is. We, we stole, stole his camera's camera, 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 camera and we decided, decided you guys needed some real quality, quality content. content. So we're going to tell you about cleaning wood the right way and the five most common mistakes we see cleaning wood i've got bam bam here expert stainless steel and he's going to tell us the biggest problems he's, 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 so you ready to get started absolutely what's the number one reason the number number one reason we say the problem with cleaning wood is they don't pre-wet the wood you add you the chemical, chemical you're using, using a whole lot more chemical, chemical on the wood, wood just to get, get it wet. wet. You need to wet you the need to wood, wood and then, add, and then add the chemical. Why would we Why pre wet other than using a lot more chemical? Well, you need well, a lot more chemical, you'd be softer on the wood. I like to think also that it's going to, we don't need to clean the inside of the wood. We need to clean the surface. We need to clean the surface. So if we pre wet, the water is going to be inside the wood and then we can clean the surface. Pre wetting, number one. Pre wetting, number one. So pre wetting wood. I really like the way Joe's got this edited. His editing team is phenomenal. But we're pre-wetting wood. Hopefully that makes sense. If you noticed in the video there, he was using just a soap tip. So just a, a soap tip on the power washer, just throwing some water on the wood. For one, the main reason um, is you're going to use less chemical. When it's 100 degrees outside and you don't pre-wet and you're just using your chemical mix itself to get the wood wet, you're going to find yourself using a lot more chemical. And if you use more chemical than necessary, you can um, worsen fuzzing. You can you can actually make yourself more work later on if you do that. And it's expensive. You know, you don't want to use more chemical than you need to. But also we have layers of wood, just like uh, layers in a book. So we have a book here. You don't you know, water goes into wood. It's going to it's going to penetrate all the way in water does penetrate into wood if it's if it's not been sealed and your cleaner will go in there with it um, if the wood's not pre-wet but if you pre-wet the wood you can go ahead and get the, the internal part of the wood saturated and then when you apply your cleaner your cleaner will not go any deeper so you can keep all those cleaning chemicals right on the surface to do what they need to do right there in the top layers of wood so um, cleaning wood pre-wetting is a, is a great thing to do and so if anybody's got questions about pre-wetting before we move on i'll check the comments um okay you're here in two feeds okay no problem 
So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my speakers in. Should have fixed that problem. So hopefully you guys caught the, the wetting the wood. Now we'll keep on keep on moving. Thanks for keeping me posted there. Free wetting, number one. Number two reason is the wrong chemical. We see this all the time. Everyone uses the wrong chemical. We see all kinds of products on the market today for wood cleaning, but most people still just jump to the old chemical bleach and it can have some problems with wood cleaning and finished product is usually not as good and you can sometimes damage the wood. So I would make sure you get the right chemical, chemical that's made specifically for cleaning fences and decks. Absolutely. And, and you can get from go from this to this and you can do it with varying degrees of strength. So every piece of wood's not the same. So you need different chemicals for different projects. So I think the number two reason, wrong chemical. So wrong chemical, what am I talking about there? Bleach, everybody uses bleach or everybody goes and they get outdoor wood cleaner. Everybody goes and they just get a lot of cleaners from the home stores that don't require that need, but don't say anything about neutralizing. So um, we feel like the second most common reason, or we say reason, kept second most common problem we see in wood restoration is people are just using the wrong chemical. They they use, um, sometimes we'll see people using something really, really, really strong to do something that really didn't need that much. And then sometimes we'll see folks using something really weak um, when they really needed something really strong to do all the work. If we get our chemical ratio just right, all of this gray over here on the right hand side, if we get our chemical ratio just right, all the gray on the right hand side will just melt away with the, with the smallest, lowest amount of pressure. When, we, when we're using pressure, we're using a 40 degree tip out of a power washer, which is pretty high pressure, most folks would say, but we're using a ball valve just before it. Those that don't know what a ball valve is, it's a it's basically a shutoff valve right in front of our power wash wand. So when we turn that shutoff, that ball valve down, we close it about three quarters. So what we wind up with is we wind up with a pressure tip, but it's very low pressure. So you can hold your hand in front of it. It's somewhere around six to 800 PSI. And that will just melt stuff away. It actually does a better job than really high pressure because we did a test 5,000 PSI once versus 8,000 PSI with the same chemical in the, in the lower pressure actually cleaned the wood much, much better. So most people would think it was the other way. So that's the way it goes. So you got to make sure of that. You got to make sure of that. Absolutely. Bam, what's the third reason? The third is wrong pressure. You can put too much pressure on the wood or not enough pressure. And this is after the chemical is on the wood. Removing that chemical, you either add too little pressure or too much pressure. It has to be just right. You have to be able to remove all the excess dirt and all the excess organic growth off the wood. But at the same time, you don't want to damage the wood by really tearing it up. How do you decide right pressure? Well, the right pressure is whatever you, you start at the top, you're cleaning the wood at the top. You're going to be able to see after a few feet if you're removing the organic growth or not. So at that point, you're going to know if you need to get a little bit closer with the pressure or a little farther away. And then you have to stay consistent with it. So once you remove it, that's the pressure. That's the one you need. And then you stay consistent throughout the whole fence. Got it. So when Bam says once you remove it, what he's saying is once you have found just the right amount of pressure to remove all the ugly and it starts revealing that beautiful wood underneath, that's your right pressure. Now you could do it with maximum pressure, right? But what we want to do is we want to start low. We want to we want to get the smallest hammer out of our toolbox and work our way up until we get just the right pressure to do the job. And if you get just that right pressure, you can do the job most efficiently with the least amount of um, damage to the wood. So so that's that balance you want to do. And by the way, guys, if you're watching this, um, I want to take just a minute to do ask you guys. A favor on our statistics 90 percent of you guys who are watching us on youtube are not subscribed please hit the bell and subscribe to us please do that subscribe and hit hit the notification bell um it would mean the world to us it would help us out a lot and then please share this with um 
anybody you know who might be able to benefit from it. If it's somebody, you know, your cousin is fixing to redo their fence or their log home, or if it's, you know, maybe you know a contractor, share the channel with him. And then also, if you're on Facebook, Instagram, wherever, LinkedIn, wherever you're watching it, please give us um, give us some love on there as well, some likes and shares, if you don't mind. The number four mistake that I see is people using the wrong dwell time. They put chemical on and they wash it off right away or they let it sit for way too long. We hear so much in the industry about 30 to 45 minute dwell times, which is 99% is way too long. Usually we can even strip old coatings off in just five to 10 minutes of dwell time. So a great way to find out if it's the proper dwell time is to use a little pressure from a pump up sprayer or the heel of your boot and rub it and see is that color, is the natural wood color coming back when you apply just a little pressure, a little pre uh, with a stick or with water. And if you get the color you're looking for, which would be a natural wood color, then you know you've got the right dwell time. Number five is inconsistent Whoop. water. Go back. So wrong dwell time, right? I pause there for you guys to think about that for a second. The wrong dwell time um, is, is something that I see. Now, first, I'm going to preface this by saying some people do need long dwell times. Some projects do need long dwell times, particularly on really hard strip jobs. But we see a lot of people that have just regular plain wood and they're putting chemicals on um, and they're letting it sit for 45 minutes or an hour. And that chemical does not stop working until it is until it is either dry or neutralized. And, and being dry also means that if it gets wet again, it'll start working again. So the longer you leave that chemical on the wood, eating at it, eating at that top layer, the more likely your wood is to become fuzzed because it's just going to keep going. And then also we see people that have really nasty strip jobs, things that they don't quite understand how much labor and elbow grease it's actually going to take. And then they put a stripper on and then... Um, they let it set for two minutes and then they try to wash it off and it doesn't work. And then, and then they say, wow, this stripper's junk. Um, no matter what product they got, you know, if it's from Sherwin Williams, Home Depot, if it's one of uh, expert uh, stain and seals products, they'll say, oh, this is a bad product. Well, the truth is you've got to get your dwell times right. And just like before, when we said you could use the heel of your boot, you could use a stick or you can use a little bit of pressure of, from water, from a pump up sprayer to see if you can reveal that fresh, clean wood underneath. Once you do, you know your dwell time's right. But for us, generally, most dwell times for us on the jobs we do here in Nashville are five to 10 minutes. It really doesn't take that long. If it's a longer dwell time than that, usually it's just because we couldn't get to it quick enough because we were moving, uh, we were getting a little ahead of ourselves. On strip jobs, most strip jobs that we do um, that are semi-trans and some even solid, uh, solid water-based strip jobs. Um, it's a five, it's a 10 to 15 minute dwell time. And we've got videos on the channel if you want to see that, but 10 to 15 minutes usually will cut through most stains when you have your, uh, wood stripper and butyl booster mixed properly. So, um, dwell time is very important. It can, it can mean the difference between getting home at four o'clock and eight o'clock at night. Um, it can mean the difference between uh, getting a really good job and then not so good a job. So I think dwell time is very, very, very important. Um, talk more about that later. Number five is inconsistent wand control. I was talking earlier about the distance from the wood. Some people, you want to go to the top and go all the way down, up and down the wood, complete one pass. All smooth at the same time. A lot of people will go back and forth. I, I seen Joe do this. You might put that in. Saw Joe going up and down the wood board, making marks. All right, guys, I'm going to warn you. Something really funny is fixing to happen. So if you would give me lots of laughs on this one, um, I'm just warning you. I hope you're sitting down. As he went down. Joe's a fence expert. He's a fence expert. Not a staining not expert. Not a stain expert. That's right. Okay, let's clear Absolutely. that up. Right? Absolutely. So, <laughs> pressure washing the wood. All the way, one one thing from the top to the bottom, and then I usually rinse all the way back up to the top just to make sure I've got all the organic growth off the board. What do you do if you've already gouged the wood by starting and stopping to try to get something off and you've got these lines? Can you fix that? Yes, you can. It's a delicate, you have to fan the wood, get it sanded out, start a little closer, and then get farther away. 
where you sort of smooth it down. It's almost like sanding, but with a pressure washer. Makes sense. Makes sense. That's five. So inconsistent wand control. What Bam's talking about there is a lot of people. We're going to pretend like this this cell phone is the uh, is the fence. Um, it, a lot of people. I've, I've got a Mike Pence fly in my office right now. A lot of people will point the pressure washer at the uh, at the fence and turn it on, squeeze the gun, and then they're just doing this number up and down, back and forth, and all this. And uh, what you end up happening is you end up with gouge marks. You end up with all these uh, stripes in the wood. And, um, you know, it seems natural to want to um, just back and forth, back and forth in random patterns just because it's it's working. It's bringing things off. Why wouldn't we do that? But when it dries, you you end up obviously with, you know, like tiger stripes. So what we can do is, to avoid that on vertical surfaces is we can point the gun up the power wash wand up over the fence, turn it on, and then we come down. And I like to use, um, again, the 40 degree tip, which is the white tip. Um, and I like to use a good one. If you're using a cheap one from Home Depot, it will probably destroy your wood. If you get a good one from a somewhere like uh, T Chem or Wash Mart or a power wash store, they're going to give you a better machined tip that's not going to have uh, light and heavy spots in it. It's going to be consistent. But anyways, we're starting above the fence. We're coming all the way down the width of one fence board. We go all the way past the bottom of the fence, let off the gun, pull the trigger again right before we go right up top. You don't have to let off at the bottom. Some people do, some people don't. But if we do that all the way down, all the way up for each fence board, we don't have to worry about those things. And then the same thing on uh, decking, you know, once we get onto a flat surface and you have railings where well, you can't start the, the gun, you can't start the pulling the trigger on your power washer um, beyond those railings. You have to, so you, so we have the pendulum motion, which is going to be, you know, your railing is here. Um, so you're going to hold the gun up in the air and you're going to do this pendulum thing because we don't want to go all the way to the railing and then stop or start. We don't want to start there. So we're going to come up high and then sweep down low. And we're going to do the full length of each board, same way we did on the fence, but we're just going to do it vertically. And those just, just that little bit of wand control and then and holding on tight, making sure you're nice and smooth and consistent is going to make for a much better job uh, when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, getting a good finish. If you notice these, these boards in the background look pretty nice reasons are the five biggest mistakes we see people making in wood restoration but we've got a bonus right yeah absolutely the Ooh. bonus is you're not a part of the right community if you're trying to clean wood restore wood stain wood all of these type projects where there is room for error especially if you're inexperienced you got to be a part of the right community that community is staining university it's an online facebook group there's about six thousand wood care professional wood care contractors in there um, that use every product you can think of and they've got thousands and thousands of years of experience there's no bigger community for wood care in the universe so that's staining university on facebook that's the probably the biggest mistake i see if you join that community throw a picture up of your project you're going to have a hundred people just instantly tell you exactly what they recommend and that will really cut down right. your learning and, curve. and a lot of the pressure washing communities they may throw different ideas that's not really good for wood works for concrete works for block but it doesn't work, work specifically for wood. So Stanley University is the go-to place for wood education. That's it. All right, guys, this is Caleb Roth with Expert Stain and Seal. And this is Bam reminding you that good fences make good neighbors. Awesome. So that was a fun, that was a fun video to make. Um, Joe was standing there in the, in the foreground. You couldn't see him, but uh, we were trying to uh, do a lot better job than he does that, which is, which is hard to do. I don't know if we did it or not, but hope you like that. Um, but those are those are some very very obvious mistakes that we see in wood restoration, and if you just follow those, you can pretty much um, you can pretty much really do a good job um, and have very few issues. But back to the question about dwell time, Roger Betancourt says I would have to assume that geographic location is going to play in dwell uh, in with dwell time for many reasons. I'm sure Phoenix is going to differ from where I am now in the Houston area. You're exactly right. Just like I said earlier, um, Colorado, the wood is so dry there. It's a lot easier to restore. Every time I'm out in Colorado, Arizona, uh, California, Northern California, 
what I noticed is that, or even Texas, Houston area, I noticed the wood's a lot easier to clean there. And I think the reason is because it's drier there. There's not as much humidity there. And when it's, when it's super dry, I, my estimation is that there's not nearly as much fuzz on the wood. And I think the reason is because the wood's not getting wet and then dried, wet and then dried. I believe that when the wood is wet from dew or, or condensation or from humidity, that it, it, it softens. And then when the sun comes up, it gets dry and it softens and then dry, softens and then dry. And so what you end up with is you end up with this top layer of wood that's UV damaged, but that's the layer that really, really fuzzes out west where it's really dry you just don't see that wood doesn't turn the same color instead of that really white silvery gray like we get over here in the south and in the north we end you end up with everything a lot of wood out west even looks stained even though it's not because it turns a different color the sun turns it more brown more black instead of white and gray and so and then when we go see that wood in person what we notice is that there's no layer of fuzz to remove. So if you, even if you did a restoration on a really old piece of wood where you would typically on the East coast, you would have to use pressure to remove that layer of wood. You just don't have to on the West coast because it's not there. The sun has baked it away and it just doesn't exist. So I think, I think you're right. That, that absolutely does have something to do with it. So, and um, I'm going to be going next week to um, New Mexico to check out the market there. So, should should be uh, should be pretty interesting to see if that holds true for Mexico, New Mexico. So that's it. Any more questions? I think we've kind of covered a little bit of data today that might be halfway decent. And uh, if we got any more questions, I'd love to take them. I'm going to do a quick shout out to some of our dealers. Um, <clears throat> if you guys, well, also the last thing we talked about in that video there was Staining University. I'm going to drop a comment because if you're watching this and you don't know what Staining University is, it's the largest uh, wood care, professional wood care group uh, in the world. And it's a clean place. I think a couple of people um, got really ill with somebody like a homeowner coming in and asking a legitimate question yesterday. And when we said, no, we're actually going to help them, a couple of those power wash guys decided that they were going to leave because, you know, wasn't the right kind of place for them. Well, Say la vie, such is life, guys. Um, it's a good group. And uh, here is um, the address, facebook.com forward slash. Uh, I got it wrong. It's facebook.com forward slash groups with an S forward slash staining university. But if you go to the group there, um, that would be that would be a great place to go. So. Here we go. There you go. Facebook.com forward slash groups staining university. There's that. If you need stain, if you want to become um, a stain and seal expert and use our products, we would love to have you. You can um, find our products at select dealers near you all over the U.S. and Canada. And um, if you want to become a dealer or distributor, um, look us up. You can go to expertwoodcare.com. If you want to buy it online, um, there's lots of online retailers, fence armor, I think Ozark fence, um, dot store. We got Perim tech. We've got, um, the stain and sale expert store, which is, which is our store here out of Nashville, but lots of places to get it online. And, um, that's about it guys. Please support our dealers. Please, uh, please check out our friends in the industry over at the fence industry podcast. Uh, my fence life, um, uh, Joe Everest, the fence experts channel. And uh, let's see, I'm from Northeast New Mexico, which place we're going about an hour south of Albuquerque. So we're going to fly into Albuquerque and then uh, and then go check it out around there. Um, so hopefully we can see you there. And then John says, expert stain and seal has super fast shipping. I get it in about 24 hours to Charlotte. Yeah, we try to get it out quick. So if you order it online, um, we can get it out quick to you guys. So remember, um, the reason we stain and seal wood is because number one, we want to keep it beautiful, but also it's the number one thing we can do to stop warping, cracking and twisting and have a, have a more beautiful um, finished product. So guys, we appreciate you. Check us out. Expertwoodcare.com, stain and seal experts.com. Um, 
And if we can do anything for you in the future, don't hesitate to reach out to us, guys. I'll see you guys next Saturday for the Stain and Seal Show.